Good evening or good nighttime uh, or good morning, wherever you are. And welcome to the 12th annual CLGS Georgia Harkness Lecture. My name is Bernie Schlager and I am on the staff here at the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies and Religion um, here at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. We are honored to have as our 12th annual Harkness Lecturer, Bishop Megan Rohr. Welcome, Bishop Rohr. We are honored by your presence with us this evening. The title of Bishop's lecture tonight is Trans Theology Without Apology, Using Art and Historical Exegesis to Celebrate Transfiguration and the Trans Aesthetic in the Bible. Now, before I introduce more fully Bishop Megan, I would like to introduce first the president of Pacific School of Religion, President David Vasquez Levy. Good evening and welcome to everyone. It is a joy to have you with us for this uh, annual Harkness lecture and a particular joy to have with us Bishop uh, Rohr as our keynoter for tonight. It is uh, a joy as president of PSR to welcome one of our alums, distinguished alums, uh, uh, who received both her MDiv, their MDiv and their DMIN at Pacific School of Religion, and also were recognized as one of our distinguished alum in 2015. Bishop Rohr uh, received that distinction at my inauguration in 2015, so our paths have crossed in many ways, and we rejoice in the remarkable ways in which their ministry and leadership have shaped the world and our communities. This lecture tonight is significant in so many different ways. At a time in which we are constantly pushed towards polarization, the importance of creating the spaces in between the recognition of the work we do to challenge the binaries that so much destroy our communities and divide, to think about the ways that we transform our realities into new ways. Pacific School of Religion and the Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies and Religion have been committed to this work for uh, decades, work that has become even more significantly important as we advocate for the justice, for justice for all, but also in this particular moment when we are being challenged by pandemic, by protest and polarization, to think anew about what our intellectual traditions, the theological reflection and the practices of our communities can bring to this moment and to bring to it a querying of all kinds of binaries, all kinds of ways that limit us to think about hybridity in our teaching, in our practice, in our worship, in our communal lives. So we rejoice tonight in the celebration. I personally want to welcome Bishop Rohr. I am an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I am delighted tonight to welcome my bishop, Bishop Megan Rohr. Thank you. Thank you, President Vasquez Levy, for that introduction. Now I will introduce uh, Bishop Megan. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr, they use uh, pronouns they and he, is the first openly transgender bishop of a mainline Christian denomination, currently serving as bishop of the Sierra Pacific Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA. Bishop Megan earned a Bachelor of Arts in Religion from Augustana University in 2001. And as President uh, David mentioned, a Master of Divinity from Pacific School of Religion in 2005, and a Doctor of Ministry degree from PSR in 2016. Bishop Megan is an award-winning filmmaker, musician, historian, and author, and has been featured on Queer Eye, in Cosmo, People, and in Wittenberg, Germany for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And let me just say a few words about this annual lecture, the Georgia Harkness Lecture. In the fall of 2010, CLGS inaugurated the Georgia Harkness Lecture, the second of the center's two named lectures here at PSR. And the Harkness Lecture is presented every October. And the John Boswell Lecture, uh, founded in 2008, is offered every April. Georgia Harkness, who lived from 1891 to 1974, was a pioneering theologian in the Methodist tradition, a leading figure in the ecumenical movement, and the first woman hired to teach theology at a Christian seminary. Harkness focused her teaching and writing 
in more than 30 books and hundreds of articles on the practical application of theology to the pressing social issues of their day, ranging from women's rights to racism, war and peace, international relations, and later in life, full civil rights for queer people. Harkness retired from teaching after serving on the faculty here at Pacific School of Religion from 1949 to 1960. The passion Harkness brought to their work of making vital theological connections among wider cultural and political issues, her keen interest in employing poetry and the arts to her theological work and her firm commitment to civil rights and social justice, all of this contributes to PSR's own longstanding tradition that shapes the ongoing work of PSR Center for LGBTQ and Gender Studies in Religion. And one more mini introduction, uh, an important one. I'd like to introduce Madison, who was our media support person, and they're going to give us some tips on uh, this evening's format. Thank you, Dr. Schlager. So happy to be here, everyone. Glad to see you all introducing yourselves in the chat. And before we dive in today's discussion, I'd like to just get some housekeeping out of the way. So please note that tonight's discussion will be both live streamed and later posted onto both CLGS Facebook and CLGS YouTube. And for our Zoom folks, that means that while the chat is not going to be a part of either stream, please keep in mind that the discussions here will be made available to a wider audience. And furthermore, for our Zoom friends, we want to encourage you to use the chat to make connections, to participate. And if you do have questions for Bishop Rohr or Dr. Schlager, to put those in the question and answer. And then finally, we do have closed captioning enabled for this webinar. So along the bottom of your screen, if you see the CC, you can go ahead and click that and turn that on to get closed captioning. So thank you, everyone. Excited to be a part of this discussion. Go ahead, Dr. Schlager. Thank you so much, Madison. Veiled metaphors and transgressive embodiments of Hebrew and Greek Bibles have been ignored, forgotten, or intentionally omitted and forgotten. Using early Christian and medieval art as inspiration this is the last part of the introduction, I promise. Tonight, Bishop Rohr will make an unapologetic case for reading scripture with a genuinely trans aesthetic. And I am so proud to introduce and welcome once again Bishop Megan Rohr. Thank you. It's such an honor to be tonight's Georgia Harkness lecturer for the Center of Lesbian and Gay Studies at the Pacific School of Religion. It's especially um, a delight to be with my alma mater, to be with those who taught me to think in transgressive ways, but also taught me that I'd had a place in religion and that my leadership could be something that is not apologetic from a back door, but in the highest uh, ranks of all of the types of churches. And I hope that my, my being a bishop and my, my talk tonight will inspire others to step into the leadership that God is so deeply calling you to. Tonight's lecture is a chapter from the second draft of my PhD thesis, because in addition to great scholarship at the Pacific School of Religion, uh, they tend to create lifelong learners. And so I am uh, just polishing up the end of that work in transformative studies at the California Institute of Integral Studies. My dissertation committee includes Dr. Jennifer Wells, Dr. Justin Tanis Sabia, and the Reverend Dr. Cameron Partridge. And their support and feedback has been a crucial part of my work. Those familiar with queer theology may have noticed that the title of tonight's lecture, Trans Theology Without Apology, is an homage to Gary David Comstock's Gay Theology Without Apology. My research is also inspired by the work of Mark Jordan, Bishop Spong, Mary Solberg, Mary Tolbert, Carter Hayward, Virginia Ramney Mollencott, Justin Tanis Sabia, Robert Shore Goss, Ken Stone, and all the brave individuals who have acted up. Tonight's conversation may seem radical and queer to some. I think that's sort of the point when talking with the Center of Lesbian and Gay Studies. Um, but it's, it's also an intentional theological choice to agitate those listening to reread the text that you might have imagined in too narrow a way. 
I will be sharing early Christian and medieval art to counter the false assumption that faithful trans and gender diverse people are new. The art primarily is illustrations from biblical manuscripts and is not unique because gender diverse people are not unique. But as a Lutheran, I must point out that diverse art that was outside of the sensibilities of soon to be Lutherans was burned during the Reformation. So in my official role as Bishop, I would like to formally apologize to everyone who has been harmed by the burning of diverse sacred art during the Reformation. To all who have been lied to and told that you are outside of God's creative imagination, I apologize for the destruction of ancient art that celebrated bodies like yours. During and after the Black Plague, theologians were scared of disease, scared of bodies, scared of diversity. Burning paintings and destroying art gave the false impression that diverse bodies were ancient from ancient, were absent from ancient life. The printing press was invented in a time when pandemic politics and religion and actions all were terrified of bodies. Those who believe our oldest Christian traditions date back to the printing of books, root tradition in pandemic mindset from a plague. A similar fear diminished the empathy and imaginations of faithful people during the HIV and AIDS crisis. Imagine if the only sacred art or theology that we had going into the future was only that created in the early days of COVID when fear and misinformation was running at its highest levels. In case your imagination has reduced in size during our current pandemic, I invite you to evict any fear of your body or the bodies of others that cling to you. Tonight, I will attempt to stretch your imagination by dwelling in words, art, and the body of Jesus. In 1971, Thomas Fairwick donated two bronze replicas of Michelangelo statues from Augustana University in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. One of the statues, David, was placed in the center of town. Growing up, I had no idea that David was one of the most famous statues in the world. All I knew was the shame my hometown had for the naked sculpture. Reminiscent of Adam and Eve, they hid David behind trees. And as it was written by Renshaw, one Baptist pastor complained that the statue was filth and that it was the work, a work installed in the city that its citizens would soon be walking the streets naked. The city decided to place the statue in plain view but in such a way that the business end of the piece was facing away from downtown, leaving his backside more publicly viewable. His nudity was from time to time covered up in ways unauthorized by the city. There have been attempts to diaper the fellow or cover his naughty bits with a fig leaf. When I moved to the Bay Area in 2001, I learned that the David statue was a symbol of the queer community. For too many years, I had no idea that queer people existed. In retrospect, the 18 foot tall statue in the middle of town was a pretty obvious clue. Similarly, the ever changing and ever transfiguring body of Christ provides many examples of trans theology that might have been hidden from plain sight. Check this one out. Like David, Jesus had a penis. <laughs> 
Eight days after his birth, as depicted in this oil painting by Friedrich Herlin, his penis was surgically modified and scarred. The same number of days linked to the transfiguration, where as Cameron Partridge says, to some early Christian readers, the reference to eight days signaled new creation, the age of resurrection. Jesus's circumcision was not the first transfiguration. John 1 tells us that Jesus transfigures from word or logos or divine reason into flesh and dwelt with us. Most of the rites of passage in Jesus's journey from infancy to adulthood are absent from the canonical gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Jesus's journey through puberty is not recorded in the text, but reading between the lines, we know what happened. Jesus's hormones changed. Jesus's voice cracked and changed. Jesus's body grew, perhaps fast enough to leave stretch marks on his skin. Jesus's hormones continued to change as he experienced fear and trauma. Yet none of these transfigurations made it into the text. These somatic transitions are omitted largely due to Paul's anti-flesh bias. Oh, we can talk about these biases for days, but now I want to argue that the changes to Jesus's body are crucial messianic moments. So check this out for a moment. This image on the left is of Daniel the prophet known to be a eunuch, an androgynous or gender diverse individual who dwelled in between threshold spaces. The one on the right, eerily similar, Jesus. A similar androgynous ascetic, similar to the eunuchs of that day. Each Sunday, churches all over the globe proclaim that Jesus is enduring words, this is my body. But we know so little about the historical body of Jesus. All human bodies change with time and Jesus must have experienced this part of humanness. However, growing stretch marks and puberty are hard to reconcile with the divine nature of Christ expressed in Hebrews, that Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Leaning into fellow centric assumptions about divinity, some Christians believe Jesus is an example of masculine perfection. Others have suggested that he was a eunuch or he was called a eunuch as an insult. As Hester says, the taunt of eunuch was meant to accuse him and his disciples of not conforming to the social expectations, indeed, the social demand to be married and produce children. In Matthew 19, Jesus says, there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone who can accept this, accept this. Some dismiss Jesus' words about eunuchs as a praise of celibacy rather than a call to accept trans or gender diverse individuals. This critique does not stand up to historical scrutiny. As Hester says, eunuchs were not celibate. Indeed, they were not even viewed as chaste. In fact, eunuchs were universally characterized by the frequency, ease, and adeptness in which they performed sex acts with both men and women. Naked illustrations of Jesus's baptism depict creative imaginings of Christ's private parts. Some show Jesus with a penis, others imagine Christ tucked, androgynous, or transfigured. Let me show you. 
picture on the left not only shows Jesus without genitals, but it puts a space right here that looks more female than male. Or those who have tiny genitals for Jesus make Jesus look again like that diverse androgen beardless Christ. Scripture does not reveal if Jesus was a eunuch because Jesus's genital history was rightly kept private. But it's worth noting, as Moxness says, the intellectual energy of both ancient and modern interpreters that has been spent on rejecting the possibility that Jesus is a eunuch in order to defend the masculinity of Jesus. These efforts and the lack of information about the fleshly flaps and folds of the historical Christ did not stop followers from imagining the simultaneously divine and human Christ as simultaneously male and female. As Davis writes, among different early Christian communities, Christ was viewed as androgynous or gender ambiguous. He was variously identified as the incarnation of the female divine wisdom pictured in eschatological visions as a woman and depicted in early Christian art in the form of Orpheus, the androgynous figure of Greek myth. Virginia Burris has also recently called attention to the sexually ambiguous representation of Christ in two fifth and sixth century mosaics in Thessalonica, Ravenna, where the figure of Christ in each case manifests a manhood that has already incorporated the feminine. And I've found more than just two. So here are some of those mosaics from Italy. Again, showing the bearded, beardless, androgynous Christ. Unlike Joseph, who fit within the masculine ideal, Jesus was part of a generation forced by social economic pressures to trade the power that came from patriarchal households for opportunity. Rabbinically trained, Jesus learned strict gender rules for labor. In addition to avoiding labor on the Sabbath, men were taught to avoid tasks designated for women. As Peskowitz writes. The toast uh, gives the names of trades it considers especially problematic. Net makers, those who prepare fibers, weavers, tailors, launderers, and peddlers, as well as millstone grinders and hair cutters. The list of trades adds texture to the Mishnah's interdiction. It clarifies how Tosefta gave meaning to the phrase crafts practiced among women. And it links these rabbinic texts from Palestine with the broader Roman discourse. Many of Jesus's parables, when viewed with a historical critical lens, transgressed gender expectations. For example, the transformation of water into wine at the wedding of Cana was more than miraculous. The preparation of wine and table serving were considered women's work and a flagrant disregard for Greco-Roman and Jewish culture. Beyond countercultural, Jesus's gender transgressions were political disobedience. Jesus not only preferred or performed gender bending work, he also called gender diverse men into leadership after observing them performing tasks associated with women. Mending nets, was a task rarely performed by men. And they were only the tran transgressing men, 
Yet when Jesus sees James and John mending nets, he calls them to become disciples. Was this gender transgressing labor the reason that Luke edited the story and described the disciples as washing their nets? Jesus also called the disciples to withdraw from patriarchal households in order to participate in counter-masculine structures and live in poverty. In order to follow Jesus, the, the disciples had to cross gender roles, as Goss says, and economic roles. They had to act as females and slaves, giving up their roles as dominating males. The highest Jewish and Roman ideal for men in Jesus's day was to study and for women to labor with a spindle. Yet many of Jesus's parables include the signs and symbols of women's labor. These teacher, teachings made religious study accessible to women. Women worked with millstones to grind flour and would have uniquely understood Jesus's lessons about punishing those who oppress the vulnerable. Women wove yarn into cloth and would have uniquely understood the dangers of mixing old and new fabrics. Unfortunately, Jesus's faith in women is not shared by his colleagues. And one of their responses is to cover women's heads and to contain the female body through clothing. Ignoring the lessons learned in Adam and Eve's story, these coverings were intended to hide female sexuality but instead they united women to the holiest leaders of the Abrahamic faith. Let's start with Moses. The second statue donated by Thomas Fawick was Michelangelo's Moses. Located at the main entrance of the Augustana campus, the statue is surrounded by trees. I remember the time I was finally brave enough to ask why the statue had horns. Those aren't horns, my stepmother said. They're supposed to be rays of light. Later that day, I looked up the story in Exodus. God asked Moses to bring two more stone tablets to the top of the mountain so that the covenant could be renewed. Moses talked to God on top of the mountain and was transfigured. Here's what it says in Exodus 34. The skin of Moses' face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with God, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin on his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Despite the biblical description of Moses wearing a veil, there are few artistic renderings of Moses clothed this way. After surveying veiled images of Moses in art, Brit, links the limited imagery of Moses in a veil with Paul's anti-Semitic comments about Moses' veil in 2 Corinthians. Additionally, as Britt writes, to accept a version of Moses who is disempowered and hence feminized by a veil was almost always too costly a bargain for Jewish and Christian interpreters. But to encounter the veil episode of Exodus is to accept ambiguity, silence, and an endlessly paradoxical idea of revelation. But Moses was not the only biblical figure who wore a veil during mountaintop encounters with God. As it is written in 1 Kings, he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. <laughs> 
Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice that said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's left unexplained in the text why a sound made Elijah cover his eyes. A covering that signified his call and the covenantal relationship with God, placing a cloth mantle over his eyes would have reminded listeners and readers of Moses' trip up the mountain. But in my review of paintings of Elijah, only a few depicted Elijah holding cloth near his face. Only one, a painting by Douglas Rosa, depicted Elijah's face covered like a veil. Following in Moses and Elijah's footsteps, Jesus also has an encounter with God. Upon Mount Tabor, the transfigured Christ stands, as Partridge says, like Mary, like Gregory of Nyssa's sister Macrina, as Marios, divine border, as Metamorios, divine transpiration, as Epiphaneo, revelation of incarnation, as Holy Scantalone, spur to wisdom, as Tupos, mark, type, opening of new creation. The transfiguration and the crucifixion are one of the few times Jesus's clothing is described in scripture. The lack of detail in the text is historically notable. As Urbano writes, dress also functions to create and signify social distinctions. This was especially true of Roman society where dress visually communicated status, citizenship, ethnicity and gender, the style, length and folds of the fabric and the color and width and stripes were not simply matters of fashion choice, but served as social codes, whether inscribed as social mores or mandated by sumptuary laws. The clothing styles worn by Jesus in artistic renderings, namely, the long hair and mantle of the philosopher better reflects the increasing intellectualism in Christian communities in the second and fourth centuries than a, an historical representation of Jesus's class, gender, and adherence to social codes. These representations also portrayed Jesus as skinny, while scripture tells us that Jesus was bullied by individuals calling him, as Matthew 11 says, a glutton and a drunkard. Early Christians and artists have long imagined Jesus in their own image. Similarly, trans individuals identify with some of the ways that Jesus's changing body is reminiscent of trans aesthetics. For example, if Jesus is light, then the transfiguration with Moses and Eliza is, is the first moment Jesus' external body matches his internal reality. Jesus' face changes and his clothes become dazzling white. The text does not say what Jesus felt, looked like, or wore as he went down the mountain from this moment. In Mark and Matthew, Jesus asked the disciples not to tell anyone. In order to keep his encounter with God a secret, did Jesus wear a veil to cover the glow coming from his face? If so, is this how he was able to talk to that woman at the well? Or how he met the gender transgressing man who carried water? and lived in the house where the Last Supper was eaten? Is the missing veil a detail that ancient readers and listeners would have assumed? 
perhaps like paintings of Moses and Elijah, those writing Jesus's story were afraid that an effeminate image of Christ would reduce his power. In my search for artistic representations of Christ wearing a veil, the only depiction I was able to find is a sculpture by Giuseppe San Martiano of Christ shrouded in a lacy burial cloth. And it looks like this. A typical burial cloth for a religious leader at the time of Jesus's death would have been made by wool with a simple weave pattern. The sculpture of a dead Jesus in a lacy shroud is representative of the sexualized way women were sculpted during the Baroque period. During the renovation of the San Servio Chapel in Naples, the veiled Christ was completed after Antonio Caradini's Veiled Truth. Both works were commissioned as memorials by Di Sangro, pairing feminine clothing with pain and death and omitting veils from the most sacred encounters that Moses and Elijah and Jesus have is political and an artistic choice tangled in the implicit and explicit biases of the artists and those who commissioned the work. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were not the only ones wearing veils during the gospel. The Zoroastrian leaders from Persia, commonly known as the Magi, wear veils when they approach holiness. The women on the way to the empty tomb would have worn veils as a sign of their grief. So if my hypothesis is correct, veils appear three times during crucial messianic moments. Instead of veils, images of the transfiguration also include a mandorla, the Italian word for almond. The mandorla originated as a pagan visca pisa, which literally means the vessel of the fish but it's in the shape of a uterus and symbolized fertility. This hiding of the feminization of Jesus, the vaginal imagery around it has led to the death of queer people. We can see this in a newspaper article related to the death of Matthew Shepard. The trial of Russell Henderson for the murder of Matthew Shepard was to have begun in the first Tuesday after Easter. At the Harvest Foursquare Full Gospel Church that Sunday, people wore name tags and expressed a serene camaraderie. Then they sent their children downstairs to play while the illustrated sermon, a dramatization of Christ's passion and death took place. It was a stunning performance, beginning with the Jesus character, racked with sorrow in the Garden of Gethsemane. The narrator said, Jesus suffered like any man, then he said, departing from the script, every time I see an image of a feminine Jesus, it makes my blood boil. Jesus wasn't a weakling. Jesus was a man. If Jesus was here today, he could take on any man in this room. Later, when the Jesus character was tied to a post, flogged by two men, soldiers who took sensual pleasure in every fall of the whip, and the narrator said, Jesus didn't cry out for mercy. Jesus was a man. Jesus was a man's man. The Jesus character writhed in agony 
After he stumbled off stage with the cross, the only sounds were his moans amid the pounding of nails. The narrator described the tender caress of the hands now ripped by sharp iron. In the congregation, men as well as women were moved to weeping. Matthew Shepard's murder on October 12, 1998 captured the nation's attention in part because images of the fence where he was left to die reminded people of the cross Jesus died on. Shepard's death and subsequent trial catalyzed a national debate about hate crimes, sexuality, and gender. When the news of Shepard's death was aired on Sioux Falls News, the roommate of my college girlfriend began crying and said, I hope that doesn't happen to Jen and Megan. In her grief, she accidentally outed me to the youth director of my Lutheran congregation. A few days later, I was summoned to an intervention and given a book on how to repair myself. On the cover of the book was the face of Michelangelo's David. In response, a few months later, I staged a dramatic reading behind the Moses statue as a final for one of my art classes. I was tied to a makeshift fence made out of pallets while my friends read an account of Christ's crucifixion from the Gospel of Matthew. A news report about the death of Matthew Shepard and the vile words of Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist Church. Over the summer, I wrote a play about my relationship with Jen that was used to promote tolerance during new student, student orientation week because sometimes art helps vulnerable communities transfigure their pain. There's no mention of pain in scriptural stories about the death of Christ, but reading between the lines, we know it happened. First, a crown of thorns is placed on Jesus's head and he was flogged more than once. Described as a dapple-backed man, Jesus's body transfigured and became as purple as the royal robes that were used to mock him, resembling the whipped back of a slave. In the Septuagint, a similar description of dappled back is used to describe Joseph's effeminate coat of many colors. The phrase dapple-backed also reminded ancient readers of the Dionysus of Nonus epic and the female fawn skin garments that had been dyed purple. Each of these references to a dapple backed were considered feminizing. There's no scriptural references of nails being pounded into Jesus's hands and feet. But reading between the lines, we know that it was part of Jesus's crucifixion. Jesus died so quickly in John's gospel that his legs are left unbroken. As it says in verses chapter 23, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record for his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. It may surprise contemporary readers that there are no words about nails, but three words or three verses about a post-mortem stabbing. Many are familiar with the wounds and scars Jesus obtained on his journey toward and on the cross, but fewer are aware of artists transfiguring depictions of his side wounds. Now, these will be graphic if you understand what they are in reference to, but they are biblical illustrations of side wounds. <clears throat> 
Jesus's side wound, depicted, depicted in the shape of a mandorla, was intentionally drawn to emphasize vaginal qualities. As Easton writes, on a physical level, the wound of Christ performed the bleeding, lactating, and birthing functions associated with the female body, ultimately signifying redemption and salvation through suffering. Just as Eve's menstruation was a punishment for the fall, Christ's death on the cross symbolically took on this pain and bleeding. Jesus's embodied transfiguration was more than a metaphor. It was something faithful people in act, interacted with in an embodied way. As Easton writes, especially women, but men too, described ecstatic experiences in which they nursed from Christ's side wound as if it was a breast or felt themselves penetrated by Christ or so lost themselves in mystical adoration and abandonment that they experienced physical shuddering that seemed akin to orgasm. In general, late medieval piety was wrapped up in the body in a way that often seems startling, even distasteful to the modern reader. Divine encounters with Jesus are out of fashion, but they were common for monastics, especially Hildegard of Bingen. Two illustrations of her visit, vivid visions are uh, about to be shown to show the depth and the breadth of those drawn to vaginal imagery of the Mandorla. Biggin's Egg of the Universe depicts the birth of the cosmos using shapes that reference a uterus and areola. Similar to the fifth and sixth century mosaics of a beardless androgynous Christ, Bingen's image of the blue Christ on the left is very simply dressed and has long hair with neither beard nor veil. The figure is not obviously male nor female. Similarities between Bingen's blue Christ and depictions of Christ birthing a female embodied church out of a side wound can be found in both coloring and design. Do you see the human being being born out of Jesus's side wound? Images of Christ giving birth out of a side wound are both biblical and liturgical. As Easton writes, the wound of Christ issued blood and water. This paralyzed the blood and water expelled from the vagina during birth, as well as the wine mixed with water served during mass. And once again, these images of Christ are allusions to Adam and Eve. Vaginal symbology in the wounds of Christ illustrates one way that the transfiguration occurs through the tearing longed for in Isaiah. As it says in chapter 64, oh, that you would tear the heavens that you would come down, that the mountains might quake in your The time of Jesus's death, there was both earthquake and tearing. These words are not only connected to Jesus's death, they're also a part of the Advent hymn in the Lutheran Book of Worship, O Savior, rend the heavens wide. O Savior, rend the heavens wide, come down, come down with mighty stride. Unlock the gates, the doors break down, unbar the way to heaven's crown. And here is the image of one painter's depiction of that tearing. <laughs> 
weaving together both the Advent and Lenten understandings of Isaiah 64, the Comte Ludwig Napoleon Leptic's painting of the crucifixion through the vantage point of the torn temple veil connotes the birth of Christianity. Just as the heavens are torn into during Jesus's baptism, damaging the divisions between the stuff of God and the stuff of demons, the temple is torn. And it damages the barrier between life and death. As Todorova writes, the mandorla highlights the paradox of life coming out of death. So the death itself can be called mother, bringing forth new life. The connection of Jesus to the mandorla shape throughout his life, death, and resurrection may be the reason that Jesus was buried in Jerusalem rather than buried individually like other Essenes. Womb tombs were barrier chambers used by the Abrahamic face for sacred women and miracle workers, including the Jerusalem tomb of Mary, the mother of Jesus. There is a long list of Jewish mystics, of women who have been buried in tombs shaped like wombs. Both in Jewish tradition, in, in Christian tradition, and in Muslim tradition, all throughout the Middle East and in the Jordan. These tombs serve as pilgrimage sites for women who are interested in spiritual support for their fertility, as Stadler and Luz write, at most womb tombs, the narrow entrance leads to a small chamber or space that contains one or more sepulchers. This expanse occasionally takes the form of a long, narrow and dimly lit passage that is reminiscent of the human birth canal. The dark, hollow and occasionally humid spaces perhaps symbolizes the anatomy of the uterus. Given the layout, the visitors are indeed compelled to move through these spaces like a fetus emerging from its mother. After the death of Jesus, the women enter the empty tomb expecting to anoint his body. Instead, they leave as midwives, proclaiming the rebirth of Christ. The discarded burial shroud should not be Remembered through Paul's anti-Semitic lens, rather the abandoned shroud is evidence that Jesus, like a newborn baby, leaves the womb tomb naked. Christ returned to the pre-fallen state when Adam was able to walk naked through the Garden of Eden without fear of their nakedness. Christ's death is the third time nakedness is highlighted in Mark's gospel. Jesus was naked at his baptism, a naked man flees during the arrest of Jesus and the abandoned shroud at the, at the resurrection. This trinity of nakedness calls us to find ways to ease our body dysphoria and walk without shame in the world. Some are able to accomplish this without medical or hormonal support. For others, loving their body involves transfiguration. I received my first written death threat in October of 2000 when biblical graffiti was written on a national coming out day banner. And it said this from Matthew chapter 18. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. I have described a few of these spiritually abusive acts in all the, all the press in the world, it feels like at this point, you could Google it. But here I wanna talk about some of the events from that community in South Dakota that helped me to transform fear and pain into advocacy. Namely, the faculty at the Augustana Religion Department reminded me that God does not seek a majority vote about whom is worthy of beloved community. The Reverend Dr. Michelle Bartel shared stories about how she had been mistreated by faithful male academics and how Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Paul Lehman, and sci-fi movies helped her make it through hard times. 
The Reverend Dr. Ann Peterson helped me to steep in the fictional gender transgressing, transgressing writings of the poet, lesbian feminist Jeanette Winterson and brought me to an ethics class for medical residents. Peterson shares her memories of the trip in a book called Our Bodies, Ourselves. My memory is that the class discussed a newspaper article about a trans person who bled to death in a hospital parking lot in the United States. The trans person had gone to an emergency room to stop the bleeding after a complication from a gender confirmation surgery performed in a different state. The doctors at the hospital claimed they could not care for the trans person because they were not specifically trained in that area of medicine. The trans person died because no one was willing to learn how to care for them. The medical residents in the ethics class sided with the hospital doctors and fervently argued that it was unethical to care for someone whose condition you had not studied. I asked the residents why they would not learn to care for a trans person when their life depended on it. But studies show that transphobia rather than education is the best predictor for provider knowledge of trans healthcare. When pressed, they all cited the religious beliefs of their Abrahamic faiths as the reason they should neither be compelled to learn about the bodies of trans people nor treat them. Even when I reminded them that their faiths taught that killing was wrong, the residents were adamant that letting the trans person die was the best ethical choice. I don't recall the specifics of what Peterson and I talked about during our drive back to campus, but by the time we arrived, I understood that the spiritual abuse directed at me was not really about me. Countless systemic and religious implicit and explicit biases were causing faithful people's ethical barometers to malfunction. I had the choice to either let the body of Christ bleed out and die, or to learn the skills needed to begin sewing pastoral and theological stitches on his wounds. Sewing and storytelling has long been a history of healing for communities. For example, the story quilts of former slaves like Harriet Powers stitch biblical stories and add them with the sacred stories that were written long after the canon was solidified. More recently, the AIDS quilt, an artistic expression for grief and ag advocacy expresses the, the community that was lost. Physical and emotional scars need attention and space to be seen and heard. Once we have heard those tales, we must also ask what happened next? The tragic tales of trans people are important to learn and share so we can advocate for a safer and more just society. But if stories of death and tragedy are all we know, we deny trans individuals transfiguration role models. We must also lift up stories of resurrection and renewal. A few months after the medical ethics class, it was my turn to lead a senior chapel service. The chapel was packed when Richard Swanson read his translation of Matthew 18. He took his time, emphasizing that the millstone was so large that the body of the person who drowned would never be recovered by their family. As he read the text, his anger was palpable. He paused and looked at me when he spoke of the little ones making it clear that he believed God was on my side. At the end of the service, I played a discordant version of Sinead O'Connor's I Believe in You, which has these lyrics. Don't let me change my heart. Keep me set apart from all the plans they do pursue. And I, I don't mind the pain. Don't mind the driving rain. I know I'll sustain, because I believe in you. Thomas Boacci and his writings about the Gospel of Matthew and the Queer Bible Commentary reminds readers that the Koine Greek word metanoia, often translated repent, 
actually means to change one's mind. Boachi hoped his translation would liberate queer readers. As he wrote, when they changed their minds and realized they were not helpless victims, but God's beloved, they would be able to do something about changing their lives, both internally and externally. Just as Jesus's body changed at every other stage of his life, Christ's gender was transfigured by the resurrection. As De Franza writes, early Christian commentators rejected the idea that sexual relations would continue after the resurrection and most envisioned a transformation of gender, particularly the transformation of female subjugation. Despite this conjecture, scripture rightly does not reveal the status of Jesus's private parts. Thank goodness. The form and substance of Christ's post-resurrection body seems to be both transient and stable enough to touch. First, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, who looks at him, but does not recognize him. Mary recognizes Jesus's voice, and Jesus asks her not to hold on to him. Next, Jesus was transient enough to enter a locked room without opening the doors and showed all the disciples, except for Thomas, his hands and side wound. Then Jesus breathed on the disciples and demonstrated both that Jesus had the breath of life and that he had a presence that could be felt in the form of breath. Jesus appeared to the disciples and told Thomas to stick his finger into his side wound. Remember those drawings of the side wound? This action is the metaphorical opposite of a dominating, phallocentric God. After my double mastectomy, I no longer wonder about the faith or doubt of Thomas when I see that painting of Thomas sticking a finger into Christ's wound. Instead, I think about the many stories in the Bible chastising the disciples for having unclean hands and what it might have meant for Jesus's healing to have an unclean hand stuck into an open wound. Before my surgery, I was cautioned by other trans men to stay as long as I could afterwards and as still as possible for as many weeks. The more I moved and stretched my skin, the larger my scars would be. After my surgery, I've talked to trans men who have large dark scars because they could not afford to rest after their surgeries. Others due to their race or genetics have chelial scars that are larger than their original wounds. If these paintings of Thomas are accurate, then Jesus had large scars too. This could be good news for individuals with diverse and visible scars. As Miller writes, the post baby body, it's not a thing women need to be ashamed of. Rather, it's a signpost of an ever greater loveliness of the post resurrection Christ. Conversely, a culture like ours, rather than try to overlook or fix pregnancies changes, Christians can celebrate the beauty of a body whose physical sacrifice bore new life. Even with the liberating interpretations of this moment, the image of Thomas's dirty finger inside Christ's wound is a metaphor for the ways cisgender, heteronormative, phallocentric people and ideas have injured countless people by physically and emotionally injuring and shaming their bodies. These transgressions are more common and dangerous for those at the intersections of race and class, sex, disability, gender, and gender identity. Why didn't any of the disciples pick up a needle and thread and sew up Jesus's wounds 
Closer reading of the text reveals that John never explicitly states that Mary, the disciples, or Thomas touched Christ. Jesus tells Mary not to hold him. Jesus shows his hands to the disciples and Jesus invites Thomas to touch him. It's artistic renderings of Thomas's story that read between the lines. We could also read between the lines, health and wellness. It is equally as possible that the disciples picked up a needle and thread to stitch up Jesus. If they did, those who wrote and illustrated the text knew how transgressive it would be to once again connect the disciples with a spindle. Similarly, there are no biblical mentions of the disciples eating the bread and the body during the Last Supper. Only Mark explicitly states the disciples drank the wine and the blood. Mark notes that the disciples drank before Jesus told them what it was. It's a matter of faith that Jesus and the disciples ate the bread and body and drank the wine that is blood. And yet this story is one of the main reasons for divisions between Christian denominations. For over 500 years, Catholics and Protestants have disagreed about the definition of the word is in Jesus's famous phrase, this is my body. Regardless of how Christians believe Christ is present at the Eucharist, Christ's body was fundamentally changed. Christ was word. Christ was light. Christ was, Christ was flesh. Now transfigured through time, space, and substance, Christ is the sound of the words, this is my body. In the Eucharist, Christ is a taste and sometimes a sensation that moves down the throat and into the belly. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus was recognized with a burning heart and a fleeting memory of how Christ blessed bread. On top of a mountain, Jesus was envisioned as a transfer of power. At the sea, Jesus was an abundance of fish and a call to feed the hungry. In 2020, Richard Swanson again invited me to speak to his class on the Gospel of Matthew. A course on biblical storytelling, I began by telling the story of Adam's gender affirmation surgery. I left long silent gaps in between the lines as I sawed a hole into a sculpture made of chicken wire and paper mache. I took my time sewing the sculpture back together with thick wire. Why aren't there any paintings of Jesus sewing Adam's wound? Of, of, of God doing this, right? Then I told the class many of the personal stories in this chapter that I've talked to you about. As I talked about Jesus' side wound, I took off my shirt and revealed the scars of my surgery. And I asked them why Christians treat trans people the way they do if my body has scars in the same place as Adam and Jesus. If my body looks more like a fleshly God than theirs. After I finished weaving stories together, I put my shirt back on and began answering student questions. The student raised their hand and thanked me for talking about my body. They shared that a pastor had told them that their eating disorder was a sign of God's displeasure. If only they prayed enough, the pastor lied. Their disorder would disappear. Watching my unapologetic trans theology helped them imagine ways they could use art to express embodied knowledge and the pain they carried from the erroneous and abusive language of that pastor. This lecture tonight is not meant to pinpoint Jesus's gender, to uncover private parts, or to gender Christ in a way that he didn't claim for himself. Rather, articulating the countless ways that Christ's gender changes throughout his life, death, and resurrection is an attempt to help others name and claim the ways their bodies shift, change, and transfigure. Now that you have seen these things and heard these things, how will you 
make art about God. View your own body and the body of your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bishop Megan. Really wonderful. Uh, at, at this point, uh, I would invite uh, people who are with us uh, to use the Q&A feature uh, for any questions you may have for um, Bishop Megan, uh, rather than the chat. So we'll use um, the Q&A. Lots of hand clapping in the chat. <laughs> I'll take it because I decided that if I was going to spend a significant portion of my life hearing other people's unsolicited opinions about whether or not I was a sinner or a saint, uh, that if most of the feedback or the time and the energy was about perceived sinfulness, that we should give equal time to people thinking I'm wonderful. So <laughs> I'll, I'll set aside my, my Midwestern and Lutheran humble nature to just receive it and say thank you. So uh, yeah, please type your questions in the Q&A. Uh, here we have one. Uh, okay, they're coming in. Uh, uh, Bishop Megan, the first, did Jesus have a race and color? Yes. But we have no idea. No, uh, he was born, he was born in the Middle East, right? And he um, lived in a time when when race was defined in a particularly political way, um, where his race might best be described as non-Roman um, or other than the, the majority class. And we don't know what Jesus's skin color was because there's not really descriptions of it. We just know Jesus got light during the transfiguration. And so um, I proudly tell my black children that Jesus was black and that um, this idea that it was different when Jesus was becoming white on top of that mountain means that in the rest of the text, that's not the description that was there. And so I think that the, the difficulty again is that because so many of the paintings were burned, because they were lost in the parchment, we have, if we only have preserved items from the places where they painted Jesus's skin tone to look like theirs, um, or that the pigment had faded. And so it makes it very hard to kind of find darker historical paintings. Although um, it's, a, it's a particular delight to me, one of the oldest paintings that depict Christ comes from Syria. Um, and it's Jesus ascending in that mandorla shape up into the heavens, outlined by all of the, the signs and the symbols of Ezekiel chapter four, that idea of the good shepherd. And then down on earth um, is Mary Magdalene, who is in the center, sort of taking over uh, a bunch of eunuch angels and then disciples looking very, very confused, like they don't know what to do next. It's one of my favorite paintings, and I hope you'll seek it out. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, have you compared the art that shows Jesus as an androgynous or eunuch to other works by the same artists for stylistics? Is this unique to works of Jesus? Uh, I haven't checked that out yet um, and looked into that. Um, it's not unique to Jesus. I don't know about those particular kind of artists, but um, it's not unique to Jesus. It's actually something that is, uh, there are a lot of paintings similar to Daniel. Imagine in your mind right now, every painting you've seen of angels, Michael, right, is, is maybe a famous one. It's that similar kind of idea of that they were kind of this androgynous or eunuch ideal. Think of if you have ever seen a painting of an angel with a beard. It's super rare. And, and some of this goes back to the Hagia Sophia in Turkey, where eunuchs and folk who kind of lived within that androgynous space were a part of Easter rituals. And so there are these really beautiful and ornate tile mosaics that depict this 
fabulously glittery festive Easter service that was like all run by the eunuch priests. And some of the paintings of angels at the resurrection, you know, the, if you've seen a painting of the, the angel who's at the empty tomb talking to the women and telling them about what happened, have that exact same kind of fancy dress that they wore in the Hagia Sophia for some of those Easter rituals. And so um, that's, that's a great idea to go back and, and check out some of those manuscripts and see how they, how they painted a bunch of the other folk. We, we, we have um, lots of other paintings of Jesus, like in catacombs, that also do not depict Jesus with a beard. I think it's not until the year 350 that Jesus is painted wearing a beard. Jesus is mostly just painted as a good shepherd with a sheep around his neck. Um, no beard, uh, and just mostly known by having the sheep there and some bread every once in a while. So it's hard to know why, um, because, you know, the catacomb paintings are, you know, just signs and symbols that are around ancient graves. And so it's, it's hard to figure out the rhyme or the reason to it, but there are very, I haven't seen any paintings or depictions of Jesus with a beard prior to 350. But I'd be delighted if there's other like nerdy Bible scholars out there who know something. I, I'm going to, if I might just get medieval on you for a bit. And I'm curious to know if you've um, looked at uh, the work of Carolyn Walker Bynum and she has this fascinating study, right? On Jesus as mother. Mm -hmm. So these male Cistercian, a form mm -hmm. of Benedictine monks in the, in the 12th century and later write lovingly and erotically about nursing at the breasts of Jesus, which is just this wonderful mm -hmm. image and spirituality. So um, yeah, there, there's so much out there, but I, that, that came yeah. to mind as I was seeing art you showed me that I'd never seen before. Um, yeah. So it was just really cool. Yeah, the female men have got this idea of that, that wisdom and sharing sacred knowledge is like breastfeeding. You, if, if it's new to you, uh, if you've ever heard the song, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, you were singing about Abraham having breasts and you didn't notice. And so there's, there's lots of very transgressing language, particularly about the monastics. There's um, in, I'm, I'm hopeful that we get kind of the, the final I's dotted and the T's crossed from with uh, my PhD because the very next chapter after this one is kind of about some of those ancient monastics and ways that we can think about how we speak about them now that we have a different understanding of of trans people so like if if our value is self-identification we can't go with the the ancient hagiographies descriptions of the genders of people and how do we handle the fact that we want old stories about people who are gender transgressing but most of these stories are rumors shared after someone died. And in the same way, we wouldn't want a dead name or use the name of someone after they died or share rumors, rumors of a trans person now and what their body was like. We have to try to figure out what is our ethic of sharing sacred stories about the trans aesthetic, about people who were transgressive, people who were living lives where they were identifying in a different way than folk re-identified them or gossiped about their bodies afterwards. And so I, I think that's one of kind of the many things that we need to figure out is how do we lift up queeros? How do we lift up saints of the past? How do we lift up folk who have similar diversity, even if they didn't have the same identities and, and respect self-identification or communal identification. And, and it's something that I hope lots of trans scholars and diverse scholars were continue to think about into the future. It's like, we wanna honor the history, but we don't wanna dishonor the people that are getting gossiped about after their death. Thank you. Some, some comments and then uh, questions. Uh, love the fresh interpretations of scripture by art. Another person, I just want to say how encouraging this is to me as a trans seminarian. Thank you also. I have those scars too and have also compared them to Jesus' side wound. Um, here's a question. Uh, what was the name of the art artist of your favorite painting? <laughs> oh, the, the one from Syria, 
I'm going to send it to you, Bernie. I'll send you a picture of the art and, and the citation so that when you okay. post the copy of this lecture and, and the slides, if you'd like, that you'll have a copy of it and we can get it. So okay, I'll do it. that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, another one uh, in Talmudic texts, there are passages about there being six genders. Are there mm -hmm. such teachings in early or later Christian writings? <clears throat> Um, yes, but uh, not not as explicit um, because so in for those who who aren't familiar with kind of the six kind of different variations like my favorite is the tum tums which which is the state that Abram and Sarah are before they become Abraham and Sarah this idea that they have kind of less defined genitals and then we have this major story in scripture about God saying the way to be faithful is for you to surgically modify your private parts. Like more people think it's weird that Abraham considers killing his own son than when God says, Abraham, you go get some, go get a knife and carve your penis into a different shape. Then carve the penises of all the people around you, all the people that you own. And, um, modify their bodies surgically like that the normative behavior in the book of genesis is to modify your genitals and so i think the difficulty is that because paul is trying to do this hard sell on this idea that no no you can still be faithful and not modify your genitals that there's there's this hope of expanding christianity to more people to the gentiles and to folk who um just don't want to have surgery on their private parts in order to convert to a religion. And so the interesting thing is that in that time period, like Paul doesn't necessarily win that argument. It's just the one that we put together when we bind our Bible. And, and it's not a thing that we necessarily always feel like we have to do in order for Jesus to love us. But how, how queer that Paul had to do such a hard sell that non-modified folk, folk who have not altered their genitals, Paul's trying to find a way to have an argument that God can love them too. Like Paul starts with the idea that your genitals are modified and God loves you. And he's trying to make the case that non-trans people, non altered people can be loved by God. And how funny that we're like the exact opposite of that now. Um, there, there is some diverse language of people kind of mystically changing sexes. There's some cool uh, myths about like the abbot of Dringenda from like Wales where he falls asleep on a rock during Easter and magically changes sexes. Uh, and then falls asleep on that same rock later and changes back again. But there's there's lots of, I think, in the, in the writings of like the Gospel of Thomas, where they're trying to have this imagination about what does it mean that like a woman could be smart? And they come up with the wrong conclusion. They come up with a very ignorant conclusion that women have to become men before they can be loved and named and claimed by God. And it comes from like a really nerdy Greek trick. So the Greek word for spirit, the Greek word for water, if you put them together, you get the Greek word for sperm. So this idea of being born again into baptism is because water and spirit is baptism. And the ritual is seen in liturgy when on Easter Sunday, they take the Christ candle until the wax drips into the water in this very visual representation of, of this nerdy Greek wordplay of sperm happening. So there's a lot of ancient texts that wrongly believe that women can't be godly, but have like these methods that through baptism, you can transform from female to male, which is what leads to a lot of those male monastics living out their faithful life. And so there, there's a lot of kind of transgressive stuff in scripture, not necessarily a unique word for it. Um, yeah, that would be the way I would put it. But I would say, look at, look at Matthew chapter 19, um, when it says that there's three types of, three ways of being eunuchs or three ways of being gender diverse. It says that there are those who have been 
made a eunuch without their choosing. That's people who have been enslaved and their, their body parts have been modified for the purpose of taking advantage of them sexually. That there, there's people who are eunuchs by birth, people who are born in the great diverse creation of God. And then there's this third category, which for me is very fascinating. Those who are eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, or those who are gender diverse for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And I think that's what would be a really fun exploration is to like figure out what does it mean to be that third category, to be gender diverse for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And so I hope that, that we can get some more folk on board of like helping us imagine or live out or have an, a unique ethic for gender diversity that's God oriented or sacred oriented. Thank you. Uh, a comment and then another question. So I, um, I, I endorse the notion that Jesus was trans based on parthenogenesis, but I wonder about the artwork as uh, so that's a comment. And then a question, if the conception of Jesus did not include the biological DNA of a male human, could this give weight to the notion of Jesus being intersex due to the lack of that DNA? Yeah, I think, I think Virginia Romney Mollenkot makes a really good case for this. I think it's a really wonderful um, way to stretch your creative imagination to kind of think about the ways that, that if God doesn't have kind of this genetic mixture that is male in the way that we think about it, it could lead to all kinds of sorts of combinations of physical ways of being in the world, of, of emotional ways of being in the world, of hormonal ways of being in the world. And certainly it draws attention to like the expanded number of ways and, and chromosome arrangements that are out there. And I think everything that points towards God's creation being expansive and diverse is something that's always worth dwelling in and thinking about. And, um, but on the other hand, so like I just spent like an hour talking about the possibilities that Jesus is gender diverse or trans or has some sort of trans aesthetic that's happening, however you want to kind of describe that, but still kind of really believe that people's private parts should be private, right? That, and that's, that's because of my own experience of not wanting people to ask me questions like that anymore, but also like a firm belief that like, we can talk about a trans aesthetic that doesn't require us to like pull the pants down on history or to invade people's privacy. And so for me, I'm less interested in what the like flaps and folds of Jesus's penis look like or whatever it looked like down there. I'm, I'm more interested in things that kind of provoke imagination. And also like, I have intentionally showed you shapes and symbols that will make it easier when you sit in church and listen to a terrible sermon or something that might be spiritually abusive. Because in most of my time uh, being in, in church spaces that weren't welcoming, because I had kind of a, a knowledge of some art history, I was able to turn off in my ear the sermon or the words that were not helpful and look around the room, particularly at the stained glass windows and see a counter narrative by the other people who were a part of the community of saints that dwelled in that in that building, and I love, um, I've I've chatted with a lot of sisters who don't get to do their own preaching. They have male priests that come in and and, and preach to um, many convents, but they did get to be on the committee of the stained glass windows, and so people have mm -hmm. intentionally put a counter narrative up in the art, in the glass, and in the paintings around the spaces, and so particularly in the places where there is some very aggressively masculine preaching, you will find the world's most vaginal imagery. You'll find lilies. You'll find all of this stuff that's kind of pointing towards a sacred femininity. And so my hope is that the, these images will give you the support you need when you find yourself in a, in a sacred place that is not fully on board with God's capability of loving everyone. And so look around more when you're in the churches and think about, you know, all the decades and the centuries when people were kind of having these 
diverse counter narratives in the in the buildings that they had. Well, we've come to the end of our time, and I want to thank you, Bishop Megan, for tonight's lecture. It was not only informative um, and interesting, but uh, fascinating, and leads me to feel hopeful and um, want to know more um, about scripture and art. And uh, thank you for your pastoral sensitivity. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this lecture. We always enjoy the support of your presence. If you have the ability uh, to support us fa financially, uh, please go to clgs.org. And um, thank you for attending this lecture. It will be made available on our Facebook page. Um, it's been running live uh, this evening on our YouTube channel and on our website. So again, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, and thank you again, Bishop Megan Moore for being our 12th annual CLGS Georgia Harkness lecturer. Good evening, good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>